right. Hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Alex. I'm a second year psychology student at UNISA. We are covering PYC 2601 and we're looking at Abram Mans Maslow. Okay. So I'm just going to run you through this little website. There'll be a link to it in the uh, content section. And I hope it helps us all learn. There's a little short video. I think that's 10 minutes. Yes. All right, so Abraham Maslow had an extremely grueling childhood. He was one of seven children um, and lived in a slum in New York. Uh, he was not treated well by his parents, especially not by his mother. Um, but he went on to be extremely successful academically and in his career and also to have very close relations with his own children and with his partner, his wife. Okay, so you can read more about that there. Uh, he started off as a hard behaviorist and went right up into PhD level under Harry Harlow. Okay, Harry Harlow is famous for his experiments on baby monkeys that were removed from their mothers and then they put them into a cage. On the one side, they had the food for the baby monkey. On the other side, they had a warm uh, mother monkey that was wrapped in a terry cloth, a piece of wire that was soft and cuddly. And the monkeys would choose to go with the soft and cuddly mother when they were distressed. So it's a rather cruel experiment. It wouldn't be allowed today. Um, and he himself went and looked at the sexual and dominance characteristics of baboons for a behaviorist perspective, a hard behaviorist perspective. Okay. Um, that whole methodology and way of working, way of looking at things fell away. Uh, other people who look at animal behavior, for example, Robert Sapolsky looks at animal behavior and uses it to explain human behavior. Amazing series of lectures you can go and look at. Um, but here he is speaking about studying baboons in situ to understand how their lives give insight into our lives. And you can see how it's actually come full circle, but he's almost looking at baboons in a humanistic way in terms of value and empathy and relating to one another and taking that full circle back to humans. So that's very interesting. I recommend you have a look at it. All right. Um, and his lectures are fantastic. When you're getting bored with psychology, you can go look at those lectures and get motivated all over again. Okay, so Maslow had almost a Damascus moment when his first child was born. He said, I looked at this child and I knew that I could never do behaviorism. Okay, again. And he started pioneering a new way of understanding psychology. Okay, as a humanist. All right. So there we have a very nice, beautiful two-minute excerpt. All right. So here are the UNESA questions, as always. I like to start with just guessing and looking at them and then going on to study the subject. But you can do whatever you like, whatever suits you best. All right. This is an amusing little questionnaire you can do. It will help you remember things. All right. So let's look at self-actualizers. So instead of looking at pathology and doom and gloom like Freud did, Maslow wanted to look at people who've actually reached the pinnacle of what they can be as human beings and who've brought themselves into an authentic relationship with themselves and their full potential. And he called these people self-actualizers. He wants to understand how they did this and learn from them. All right, so he believes that people are essentially naturally good unless they are stressed, in pain, or in a society that does not enable goodness. Each of us is responsible for our success. We're not passive recipients of forces upon us from inside and outside. We have a natural yearning to be the best we can. Um, and we strive to get, and the striving, because we want to gratify our needs, that drives our growth as human beings. One of our needs is to actualize ourselves, okay? So we're not just about food, sex, comfort, and power, okay? It's a lot deeper and richer than that. We are a lot more awesome than that. 
So um, people should be understood holistically as whole beings and not as fragments of biology drives and impulses. So a direct response to psychoanalysis and a direct response to behaviorism, okay? So here you can see the um, comparative comparison between the three. So psychoanalysts hold up a mirror to humanity, which gives us an understanding of our unconscious drives and the structure of the human psyche. Okay. So studying all humans, looking at unconscious drives and structure. Behaviorists studying caged animals, presenting stimuli, you record and quantify fixed reproducible responses. Whereas the humanist studies healthy people, optimally functioning self-actualizers to learn the real potential of humanity. I'm going to go and close that door. Give me a minute. So it's a pyramid. In other words, the foundation is required before the next layer can be added on. Um, it's not rigid. It's not like he said, oh, you can't have the second layer until you've got the first layer. But usually you need the first layer in place before you can have the second layer. When things are falling apart, people regress and they go back to needing the basic requirements in order to survive before building up again to self-actualization. Okay, with the odd exceptions, such as the passionate artist who is prepared to suffer and starve and not have their basic needs met in order to meet the higher needs. All right, so it starts at the bottom, physiological needs, air, food, water, shelter, clothing, and sleep. Okay, then it goes to safety and security. So that's stability, family, property, employment, health, knowing where you fit in your community. Then love and belonging, okay, friendship, family bonds, intimacy, connections, relationships. Then after family bonds, love and belonging, we come to self-esteem needs, confidence, achievements, respect of others, sense of self-esteem from oneself as well, connections, and a need to be an individual and not just a member of a community. Finally, we get to self-actualization, which is where higher morality, creativity, spontaneity, acceptance, experiencing purpose, meaning, and inner potential come in. So it goes basic biological needs, safety and security, love and belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. Okay. Okay, you can just check your memory with this game. All right. There's two kinds of motivation. All right, there's first deficiency motivations, and this correlates with the first four levels of the pyramid, which was what? It was physiology, safety and security, love and belonging, and self-esteem. Okay, so those are motivated by deficiency. And then the pinnacle of the pyramid, level five, self-actualization, is not motivated by deficiency. So for the first four, as soon as your needs are met, you're not motivated anymore, you've done, you're finished. With self-actualization, even though your needs may be met, you're still motivated. It's because it's a growth motivation, okay? Here we have a little bit of memory tools. These are nice, simple ones. Okay, let's go through the needs. Physiological needs, survival, bodily integrity. Six falls partially into this one and partially into level two and three and four and five depending on how you go about it. All right, safety needs, not just physical safety, but stability, structure, predictability, and social order. So laws and regulations come in there. Love and belonging, being in a group, being able to give and receive love and connect. Self-esteem, meaning I feel good about myself. I know I can do things. I'm strong and independent your esteem of others, social standing, importance, being appreciated and respected. You can see the individualism of Maslow's theory compared to uh, more collectivist cultures like African cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, Asian cultures. You can definitely see that he's a Westerner from his theories. Okay, and his understandings. The need for self-actualization. 
There are 17 growth motivations, also called meta needs or B values. We don't need to memorize them, we just need to kind of notice them. Let's remember that growth motivations, meta needs, B values. Okay. Truth, justice, meaningfulness, beauty, order, simplicity, perfection, wholeness, completion, totality, uniqueness, aliveness, goodness, autonomy, humor, effortlessness, knowledge, and understanding. Self-actualization is the process of becoming all you can be, making full use of your talents and potential. Development of personality. As babies develop, they develop according to the hierarchy of needs. But people need more than their basic needs met. They need to fulfill their meta needs too. It is as necessary for man to live in beauty rather than ugliness as it is necessary for him to have food for an aching belly or rest for a weary body. And you can see this, even um, someone homeless living in a bunch of plastic bags and cardboard still finds a way of creating beauty in their home as well as function. Okay, so if your needs aren't met, you can regress to lower levels on the hierarchy. Everything falls apart. Your first need is for shelter and food and water. Okay, and it's not rigid. Okay, the point of the theory is not a rigid pyramid. It's to say that people should have their needs met. That's what it's about. So why do people fail to self-actualize? Okay, the first reason is lack of self-knowledge and insight because they're just taking in other people's, other people are telling them what to do all the time and they're not taking it on, okay? Obstructions in life, like not having their safety needs met, okay? Um, Jonah complex, running away from your talents and thus also from your responsibilities, saying not me, not me, not me, not me, I don't want to do this, it's too hard. Okay, fear of overestimating yourself and being arrogant. I think this is a very strong thing that holds people back. Okay, fear of the sin of pride. All right, lack of integration. All right. Not, um, especially because of seemingly opposing needs or social norms. So who you want to be and who society tells you you can be might not be the same thing. Your need for artistic expression might be in conflict with your need for love and belongingness, in which case you might choose to sacrifice self-actualization for the sake of love and belonging. Okay, optimal development. The self-actualized person gets all their needs met and has many of the following 15 characteristics. Again, you can see this is very Western it's very much his own personal idea, but let's run through them. Being a realistic observer who can tolerate uncertainty. Accepting yourself, others, and human nature. Being spontaneous and authentic. Being involved in a greater task or calling. Able to enjoy isolation and disengage from people, not being hooked on them like an addict. Independent of the environment and society, a free thinker. Appreciate the basic beauty of life every day. Having peak experiences of wonder, joy, and mysticism, okay? Concern for humanity. Having a small group of intimates, strong interpersonal relationships, but only with a few people, not with everybody. Being democratic and egalitarian. Moral discrimination, being able to see what is morally good and bad and why and how. Being kind and having a philosophical sense of humor. So a humor that does not laugh at the suffering of others, but laughs with them compassionately at the human fate, okay? Being playful and creative and resisting convention when necessary. 
Maslow about psychopathology. All right. Maslow thought about how people limit themselves as a form of psychopathology. And he said people become pathological because of unmet needs, or also because of over gratification of needs and lack of boundaries. So he wasn't like totally unrealistic. You know, he does have the idea of the spoiled child as part of his theory. This is also true of the higher meta needs. If your meta needs are not met, it can lead to pathology. Okay. Very much a needs based understanding of humanity. Okay, so this emphasis on human needs has been very beneficial to humanity, I think. It's been very much applied in the workplace, education, and psychotherapy. In education, students should be encouraged to reach their potential. We take this for granted nowadays, but it really does come from Maslow and his related thinkers. Okay. Um, in therapy, the therapist is a facilitator of growth, a guide towards insight, insight therapy, and helps the client get his or her needs met, need therapy. Okay. What is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. Okay, how does Maslow see religion? Um, he sees religion as, let me just check something. Okay, as an intense personal experience, part of sexualized social self-actualization so then it'll be a good thing so your average mystical experience good as a social convention it's a defense and a limitation on authenticity getting well dressed and being very concerned about what the neighbors think in church bad okay research Maslow could see the value of quantitative hard research like behaviorism, but from his view, experiential holistic research that enables an insight in the sub, into the subjective world of people being evaluated would be most useful. He came up with questionnaires to evaluate a person's degree of self-actualization, and he came up with questionnaires for needs assessments. Okay, how does Maslow see aggression? People do indeed have a destructive and dark side, but sometimes aggression may be caused by unmet needs. We are ultimately responsible for our own choices and actions. All right, the original 1965 personal orientation inventory test is very long. Here's a free short test that covers most of the bases. Here's a very nice YouTube talk, two minutes. And that is the end of the session. I really hope it's helped.